Despite what you may have read in books, not everyone nailed to a tree gets reborn, all right? Cheers. Welcome back, kids, to Sunday School, a series of videos where I, a guy who lives under his bed, explains to you how you should read fantasy, because I get no qualifications and that's how the internet works. This is my ongoing series on how we read fantasy or different approaches to reading fantasy. It's um, episode number two, and we'll talk about the portal quest fantasy and fantasy as a genre discourse today. Um, I'll use The Summary by Guy Gabriel Kay as the explanatory, like the example text here. I talked about that that would be the case, so expect spoilers here. I'll try to not go too deeply into things that are mentioned in the follow-up novels um, The Wandering Fire and The Darkest Road. We'll talk about these books in the next two two episodes, so here's already your reading assignment for next week. The Wandering Fire, it's a bit shorter than this one, um, and uh, we will talk about mythology and fantasy and their relationship, so if you want to read up on, you know, your classic myths in some form or other, that is, well, I can't ask you to do anything, so <laughs> no worries, but, you know, those would be helpful next week, discussions of Celtic mythologies, different ones, Irish mythology, um, Welsh mythology, Norse mythology. Not sure if we'll get into Greek and Roman, uh, Greco-Roman classic Mediterranean mythology as well, but those will be topics that come up. So if you are, say, um, reading, well, Gods and Fighting Men about Irish mythology or the Mabinogion about um, Welsh mythology, those are good entry points. Norse mythology, despite what Ursula Le Guin says Norse Mythology by Neil Gaiman is, in fact, a pretty fun uh, book to read. Um, if you want you know, to learn more about that part of uh, mythology... But once again, we'll talk about it next week, and we'll use uh, The Wandering Fire. If you have ever heard about, say, uh, King Arthur and Arthurian legend, that will also help. But, you know, I'll spoil it for you anyway, so you don't need to bother to read all of that, <clears throat> if you don't want to. So that's uh, what will happen next week. So let's talk about what I want to do today with you, when we talk about fantasy as genre discourse, um, which I'll explain what I mean, and then we'll go through it. So, what do I mean? See, art, in general, is always a discourse. It's a conversation. Artists are inspired by stuff. Artists um, watch other artists, and then they, you know, take all these inspirations in and give them their own spin, react to stuff, um, try to do something explicitly different than older artists, try to use techniques or whatever, um, and reply to them in, you know, adapting them, making them their own, so forth. That's how art works, because that's how humanity in general works. We, well, are a discursive species, I guess. So... That's the large part. Literature does this very explicitly because we're using words and we can do a lot of stuff with words where we can, you know, quote other authors, take over some of their um, verbal tics or whatever if we want to poke fun at them, so forth and uh, so on. That's something that happens in literature a lot. Also, literature, um, like any form of art, does develop some sort of surrounding theory and structure. Now, for you know, your mainstream liter literature, um, literary fiction, and so forth. Usually you have conversations in the literary sciences at universities. A lot of authors in that area do sometimes teach at universities, say uh, Malcolm James, uh, Malcolm, whatever, <laughs> Marlon James, that's the name. Marlon James, um, the writer of, uh, among other things, uh, A Brief History of Seven Killings and the Dark Star t trilogy now with uh, Red you know, Black Leopard, Red Wolf, the other way around. Uh, you know what I mean. Uh, that guy um, is a professor of literature, for example. Other authors of these, you know, fields do the same thing. And what that means is that um, there are theories, and a lot of writers in these fields are aware of certain ideas, con conversations that are about, like critical conversations that are about the art that they are creating. And that's fine. That's always something that has happened. We can look back and we see how authors in the 19th century talk about art and how to make art. That's exactly how you get like artistic movements, like the Romantic movement or realism or whatever. And that's fine. 
My argument, however, is that fantasy, in particular, is somewhat different because the this conversation, this artistic conversation, the development of the genre as such, is something that happens very explicitly in these texts within this genre and not necessarily outside in, in, in academia, that the role there is somewhat reversed and academics are, if at all, well, trying to define what happened in the movement in hindsight afterwards. Um, and I'll try to explain why I think this is the case and I'll try to showcase what is going on with the cemetery, among other things. So, why do I believe that it is very explicit in fantasy? Well, from the beginning, fantasy has had not the best of, you know, positions within larger um, literature, uh, literary discourse. It's always, or for a long time, has been seen as, well, not as good, which is obviously dumb, don't get me wrong. Um, maybe literature, books for children, fantasy, escapism, those terms are often used derogatory, uh, yeah, derogatorily. And that has led to the fantasy genre um, being somewhat apart from large parts of the grander literature, um, literary field. Now, obviously, you have some artists, some authors that um, move between these fields. Someone like Michael Chabon um, writes, uh, starts out writing um, literary fiction in the contemporary mode and then slowly moves into a genre fiction because it's something he enjoys reading or enjoyed reading. We have had cases like that before and we'll have them again. But overall, fantasy stands somewhat apart, which makes it um, very interesting to see how fantasy as a genre evolves. And it evolves, obviously, by fantasy authors um, reading other fantasy books and sometimes talking with each other and just moving forward a feel that they like somewhat as fans in the direction that they want. We see that this even with, you know, big authors like J.R. Tolkien and um, C.S. Lewis. Famously, they started writing um, their books because they didn't get enough um, fantasy books that, they, that and science fiction books more often that they wanted to read. And they're like, well, I guess we need to write the kind of books we like. So they made that deal that um, Lewis would write a, fant a science fiction novel about space. I wrote that book. It's um, Out of the Silent Planet and what comes after that. And uh, Tolkien was to write a science fiction story about time, which he tried to write and never published, but we have several examples of him trying to do that with, you know, time travel or memories that come back and rebirth and stuff like that, which obviously also ended up in his larger project, Middle Earth. But my point here is that even these genre-defining authors, in a way, were already fans of the genre that way they were creating and reading other fantasy books and talking about them, <clears throat> sometimes inviting these authors, which is why, say, um, the author of The Worm Ouroboros um, was invited and met with J.R. Tolkien and the other Inklings when they talked about fantasy. Or C.S. Lewis wrote a letter to uh, Mervyn Peake when the first Gormenghast book came out because he wanted to talk with him about books, um, which didn't happen as far as we know. But my point here is authors always within the fantasy field, up to a point where fans of the genre. It's even more explicit when you look at a large part of the early beginnings of contemporary fantasy in the 20th century that was in magazines, um, pulp magazines as we call them. See, we have... Um, well, Weird Tales, Astounding, um, Amazing Stories, all of these different magazines of short fiction or serialized fiction in the 30s before they kind of move a bit back in, well, and are sort of taken, that space is taken over by comic books in a way. But up to that point, and even in the 50s and 60s, magazines are a key part of the science fiction and fantasy genres. Stories are more often produced as short stories or serial novels in these magazines that are published there, and not necessarily as full-blown novels. A lot of books that we know as novels nowadays are, in fact, um, 
well, bind-ups of these short stories uh, that were then kind of put together into a larger book. Um, for example, um, A Canticle for Leibowitz in, in science fiction is one of those cases. Pavan, as far as I know, by Keith... Uh, Keith Red? Whatever. Keith Roberts, that's the name. Um, goes down that direction. There's a lot of these cases. And the important part with magazines is that they always had letter columns. And in a lot of cases, people that become authors later on um, the first, like, writings that we have are letters written to, um, magazines, uh, to magazines. I think it was Fritz Lieber who wrote a letter to Weird Tales complaining about, um, something in a Conan the Barbarian story that he didn't like and stuff like that. So, fans have, from the beginning, been very influential on the further movement and the further discourse of how fantasy should be and what fantasy should be. Writing letters to these authors, authors replying to these writers, um, sometimes openly in magazines, sometimes in, uh, well, the long conversations and letter conversations that people like uh, J.R. Tolkien did have with their fans, <laughs> like, you know, Gene Wolfe, who re received a letter from Tolkien and other authors that wrote to Tolkien and then got letters back and went on to become authors themselves. It has always been thus in fantasy in a more open, more explicit way than um, in some other literary disciplines. And partly I feel that is exactly because fans and writers alike in fantasy kind of know what they want the genre to be. All of us have like a feeling what makes a good fantasy story. Um, but the process of figuring out how to put that into words is what fantasy and fantasy genre discourse is about a lot of the times. We, we have this dream, this idea of what we want, of the perfect story. We all do, whether we read or we write. And we're trying to put it into words and make it real. That's, that's a key component of the fantasy genre. Figuring out what fantasy is, is an ongoing process, and authors and readers alike are engaged in that process. And a large part of, well, figuring out is just writing fantasy and trying to put it into words and seeing where the genre goes by just acting in it, keeping that discourse alive. These books are part of the genre discourse. And, um, well, academics trying to figure out what fantasy is oftentimes come afterwards and look at this huge pile of books and go like, well, so is this still fantasy? Is it not? Does it matter? And, um... Yeah, so the, the structures that we have nowadays, the terminology that we sometimes have, have come rather late and um, are mostly after, well, <laughs> after the fact, so to speak. <clears throat> I, I think that's, that's why reading fantasy, in a lot of ways, as an author and most likely fan of the genre, engaging with the books that came before, taking what they liked, using it, embellishing on it, taking what they didn't like, subverting it, arguing against it, deliberately going in different directions, paying homage to very specific elements. All of that stuff is what makes fantasy, what makes an individual fantasy book one more keystone in that edifice of fantasy that we're building, one more argument in that ongoing conversation of what the perfect fantasy book actually is. And that is definitely what I want to talk today about with, well, this one specific book, The Summer Tree by Guy Gabriel Kay. Because it does these things fairly explicitly, and um, that's what I want to look at here. See, first of all, um, Guy Gabriel Kay helped um, Christopher Tolkien um, edit the uh, texts of Tolkien that turned into the Silmarillion. So he's part of the Tolkienian um, tradition in that regard. He's also Canadian with, um, well, other influences that we'll talk about. Um, well, that makes him already part of that conversation in a different way. And you can certainly detect elements of Tolkien's world-building fantasy ideas in, well, Fionnavar, in the Fionnavar tapestry. But you can also find other elements in here, and um, those are just as interesting. I'll argue for all of these, and then I'll see where certain elements that have come up before that Kai gives a very, very specific spin to um, then show up in other texts later on, or at the same time, because, you know, <clears throat> these ideas are used by different authors in the tradition, <clears throat> which is good. But first we need to talk about the form here for a moment, because this is a portal fantasy and a quest fantasy, something that um, author Farrah Mendelssohn has tied together in the portal quest. And um, we'll talk a bit about that and then we go into very specific elements. All right, so what's a portal quest? Well, 
Someone goes through a portal into a different world, the fantastic fantasy land, we'll call it, we'll call it fantasy land for now, fairy in Tolkien's case and so forth, and goes on a quest there and um, do so, uh, does something there and then returns to their own story, to their own world. Um, it is, well, the quest comes somewhat from the epic fan, well, the, the epic, the traditional, you know, Jason going on a, um, Mediterranean boat trip, um, uh, stealing, uh, women and, um, <laughs> artisanal, um, wool products, I guess, and, um, <clears throat> stuff like that, um, so it, it does have these roots. The term here that I want to use in addition, well, it comes from the study of fantasy, is the taproot text. There are books, there are texts that are not fantasy, but they have been, well, influential on the genre. And a lot of mythology, a lot of epics of these types are taproot texts for fantasy. Their form, their idea is influential here. They are not part of the genre, but they are down there in that sediment of literature. And um, if you look at fantasy, you can tie a direct line from one to the other in a way. That, I feel, is important here. So these are one of the roots, one of the tap roots of the portal quest right there are, well, medieval mythology, legends, epic quest uh, narratives from the ancient world. Those are one big piece there. There's others. Um, one that I think is important and that I personally really appreciate um, someone like Mendelssohn turning out, uh, pointing out is the club narrative. See, the club narrative um, is a Victorian thing. It's like a bunch of gentlemen sitting somewhere telling, when one of them is telling a story. And that is important for the portal quest here. Um, because what happens is that story has a finite end. It is bounded. It starts with someone moving through the portal, doing the quest, coming back into their own world and leaving that other world behind. It's a travel story in a way. And that comes with some ideas. It's like we kind of know it'll be all right because the story is already over. It is told to us after it happened. We know they'll, that at least some of the people will survive and all will be well in that regard. It also means that Fantasyland is quite different from our world. We need explanations. It can lead to a classic travelogue. We have a lot of those in the 19th century with, you know, people going on travel through the Middle East, through India and so forth, mostly British people, and then writing a story with fun descriptions, elaborate descriptions of all the interesting and weird places they visited and then coming back and ideally having learned something about themselves, but also, um, well, done something positive for all those um, <laughs> savages out there. And that's the example that I just gave is important because the portal quest fantasy does have an imperialist, colonialist element to it in that regard that we focus on our characters that come from one world, our world or whatever you want to call it, uh, being somewhat more important, superior, sophisticated, whatever, than the fantasy land that they enter. And that's where the, um, the white savior sometimes comes from, because the other part of the quest narrative is a three-part structure. It's uh, the idea that um, the that fantasy land is in danger. It's uh, what um, some scholars call thinning. The world is in danger. It's thinning. It's fading away, and so forth. <clears throat> then there's recognition. The problem is identified. Someone is to blame. Um, it may just be a, well, <laughs> a ring that needs to be put into a volcano, uh, that kind of stuff. The world needs fixing. And our heroes that are have come through the portal are the ones who do the fixing. It's the hobbits that leave the Shire and need to go out there and make sure that ring gets, well, disposed of. <laughs> Recycled, I guess. Um, <clears throat> that kind of stuff. And the third part is, well, then, well, reconstruction. The world is made whole again. Now, there are um, very conservative elements to that. Usually it is, well, the king comes back, the rightful king comes back, and because a kingdom, uh, well, a kingship is tied to the land in a lot of these uh, narratives, then the land is healed as well, and so forth. And then our heroes can move back home. Job well done. Um, and yes, there is that imperialist, colonialist attitude to a lot of these books in that regard, which means our characters, who are the ones that we look through, will, you know, gaze and wonder and all, at all these fantasy people, um, but they can never really become part of that culture. They will always stand apart and in a sort of power dynamic where they are somewhat superior and change their fates um, with 
fairly little regard because they know better, they know how to solve the problem. They usually get like a guide or one or two guides that explain stuff to them, you know, your, your Gandalf to do all the lore drops and shit like that, because they are strangers to the land, which is something that we, as the reader, need to understand fantasy land as well. Those are elements that have been in quests for a long time, and um, there's nothing wrong with that, because, once again, form is something that we understand because we're part of that genre as readers. And what we mostly can look at is, like, how does a specific writer in a specific book engage with all of these elements, the good bits and the bad bits? Do they try to change something? Do they try to maybe make the whole thing less imperialist? How do they do that? How do they build relationships between characters in different worlds? How does that happen, for example? Bits like that show up again and again. Do they try to avoid the the, the lore drops, in a way? How do they do that? A lot of that is really interesting, and um, I guess we can see a lot of that happening in this in this book, um, the summer tree. So let's 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 look at the summer tree for a bit, right? It starts out as a standard um, portal quest with a portal, a mage, Lauren Silvercloak, whom you may um, you know connect to. Well, all those classic wizards, Merlin, Gandalf, whatever shows up in Toronto and takes a bunch of students into his world, Fionnavar. Um, supposedly just for a celebration of the king's 50th um, crown anniversary, um, but then obviously things go awry. But yeah, we have the portal here. Someone is called, they travel to a different world, and, well, we recognize the thinning, the problems right there. The land is under a magical drought, and so forth, and... Um, so the portal quest thing is right there. Someone, well, needs to figure out what's wrong and how to stop these things. Now, there are obviously other elements in here that are, well, different. So we have the, the portal with the wizard dragging someone over, whether it's, you know, Gandalf dragging uh, Frodo out of the Shire or Bilbo, as you know, may see. Um, whether it's um, people stumbling through a wardrobe into a magical land full of talking animals that are all rather conservative. Um, in this case, we have very explicitly the wizard dragging them over. <clears throat> so far, so good. What other inspirations are there? Well, from the beginning, Fionnavar is said to be the first of worlds, where all other worlds are just reflections or shadows of Fionnavar. And things happening on that first of worlds will reflect on things happening in other worlds. Now, that is an interesting idea. It's one that has been around for a while. I would say... Most explicitly, it's argued in The Chronicles of Amber by um, Roger Zelazny, which you should definitely read, where Amber is the truest of all worlds, and all the other worlds around it are just shadows that change individual elements from that truest of all worlds until they are completely irrecognized, well, uh, different from uh, that truest of all worlds. You have that whole, like, order versus chaos thing in there. It's not explicit in this book, but, you know, you can see a parallel between Fionnavar and Amber in that regard. And I would argue it's probably, well, somewhat deliberate. I, I expect, um, written in, like, the 80s, um, that Guy Gavril K was at least aware of the Chronicles of Amber, which were published in the 60s and 70s. Um, so I expect him to know that idea <clears throat> and taking that, because it, it allows him to have a fantasy world and put it into a relation to our world um, that is interesting. It's like, yeah, our world is just a reflection of these things in there. It does something more, um, and I want to just hint here, foreshadowing for the next two um, parts, because it um, is doing that as well. Fionnavar is the truest of all worlds. So Fionnavar's history is always connected to our history. It allows something, which is our mythologies will be somewhat similar to mythology and history in Fionnavar. <clears throat> so we will find recognizable elements of mythology there, which is cool. And it allows us to dig deeper into that. We'll also find fundamental human elements in there um, in a next layer, because all of these things are, of course, connected. So we will be going down into that first of all worlds um, through the next episodes on our own hero's journey to figure out what's going on with fantasy there. So we'll talk about mythology next time in that regard. What we need to understand right now, however, is another element of the fantasy quest, which is... Um, the portal fantasy, which is fantasy worlds need 
history and background, backgrounds, right? They need history, mythology, and so forth. Usually we'll get told these kind of facts by storytellers, you know, your Aragorns telling people the story of Luthien and Tinuviel, and, <laughs> well, we find an echo of Luthien and uh, Beren, um, Beren and Luthien in this world with Lisanne and uh, Mergen Whitebranch, the first wizard. There's a lot of perils if you've read, say, the Silmarillion and other old Tolkien's writings, you'll recognize all these elements in here. Um, <clears throat> but what happens is the past is fixed. The past is fixed. It does not get reassessed. Now, if you study history, if you do history things, you recognize that that's not how history works. History is always changed. We always reinterpret, change our view of the past because we can never go and know. History is not fixed. However, in these worlds, especially because they are, as I said, like somewhat imperialist, colonialist in that regard, and told to us by an outside voice, in a way, as a closed-off narrative. And this book does have, you know, <clears throat> these kind of mentions where, while we don't have an explicit narrator as, say, in The Hobbit, we do definitely have that narrator um, going, yeah, and uh, if he had only known this part, it would... There's foreshadowing in that regard and outside comments happening in this book in that regard. <clears throat> but my point is, that omniscient narrator out there knows the fixed history of the world. So all these things that are presented to us, mythologies, prior events, they are true. We can't question them in a regard. And that's, that's another element that the... Um, Portal fantasy needs to deal with that. Tolkien just tells us all these stories, and while they may or may not um, <laughs> change over time, whenever Tolkien wrote something new and so forth, they are sort of um, finite mythology, which is more or less definite. And we get told these elements through tales. Gagavri K does the same. There's elements of the history that are told to us, and he does something here that I think is clever, and it kind of goes tries to change things there, which is he has different characters get told different parts or elements or facets of the same story. For example, the Lisan Mergen story, the Luthien Baron story, basically, which leads to the Wood of Pandaren being, well, somewhat pissed off because someone took away their um, wood nymph, so to speak. Um, <laughs> um, but we, we have different characters getting told different parts of the story from different perspectives. And while the, the main fact, which is um, Wizard goes into the wood, um, uh, well, Dryad or whatever you want to call her, shows up, they fall in love, they go away, Wood is pissed, um, and then, well, a more Eorondil, Elwing kind of story happens, and then she um, throws herself from the tower. Those facts are not actually questioned. The different perspectives are at least different, so we get a hint that, well, there might be indisputable facts, People from different places have different views of history. So that's that's one way that uh, Guy Gavril K does try to play with the con well the, the restrictions of the form that he's using, the portal and quest fantasy here. There's more, of course. Another one is um, the doubt. Well, <laughs> the lore drops. There are these lore drops. But another aspect that he does is he makes Kim seer of um, Brennan with the soul of Lisan, not Lisan, um, Isan, whatever, the older seer in her. So Kim already knows she's somewhat part of the world, as is, in a different way, um, Paul, <laughs> once he has the gods memories once he has hung on the tree. So there, there is that, and I, I appreciate the attempt to make it less, well, touristy in a way, <clears throat> while other characters are still somewhat touristy or um, other elements. Another thing that we see here um, that I personally find interesting is obviously the idea of tapestry and weaving. <laughs> Pet peeve of mine, the Wheel of Time is bullshit, you know that, but the Wheel of Time talks about well, fabric or weave or whatever you want to call it. Now, obviously, you don't need wheels. You need a loom to weave with shuttles flowing back and forth. So that's a bit that um, Jordan, in his usual tendency to mix metaphors and get it wrong, um, got wrong because he kind of confused spinning and weaving. Here we have a weaver who is not further named, um, but who creates the tapestry. And uh, <clears throat> there's, there's other... Um, Authors that have picked up that idea of, well, 
Human history being similar to a tapestry, that's why weaving um, mythology is so um, well popular in Norse mythology and other mythologies where you have characters that are weaving and um, creating the threads of a tapestry. That's, that's one way of looking at how humans interact, I guess, that is a metaphor that is very deeply ingrained in the human language. So making it explicit comes natural in a way. I just wanted to mention that part. We need to look at one final thing here before we end it for today, because I already talked way too much, I feel, and that is psychology for a moment. <clears throat> now, we'll go back to psychology later on, but a lot of authors have always been aware of the fact that fantasy is somewhat an exploration of human psychology, of the human soul, of figuring these things out. Tolkien does hint at that somewhat in his idea of the fairy story with, well, um, healing and the you catastrophe, um, the happy ending, so to speak, which he connects to Christianity, um, which is, you know, one way to put it. Later on, um, <clears throat> Stephen R. Donaldson makes it very explicit when he makes his stories in the land a reflection of the inner life and mental life of Tom's Covenant. And uh, <clears throat> in a way, Guy Gavril K takes these two elements here as well. This is the truest of all worlds. It does reflect human struggles at its core, but it can also give healing in a way. That's the story of Paul, or Will Twiceborn in this case, right? He goes down into this fantasy world, becomes one with it, gets tied to the summer tree to sacrifice himself. And through all of that, he gets his happy ending, his eucatastrophe, which is reconsoling himself with the tragic events of Rachel's death in the car accident that he may or may, well, he was powerless to um, prevent. Uh, he gets he gets to live that you catastrophe within this first novel, this first quest. He achieves that in a fantastic setting. But there is psychology happening here as well, which is confronting about our traumas and so forth. And we'll go deeper into that um, in our um, third book uh, discussion about the Fiona Bar Tapestry, where we tackle the psychology and the philosophy. But I wanted to bring it up that it is already in here, and it is somewhat, I would argue, a, well, a next step in that conversation that people like J.R. are talking with his essay on fairy stories, and then later on... Um, <clears throat> Stephen R. Donaldson, with his novels and his essays on the epic fantasy, um, have already started to work on. And Guy Gavril K. adds his thoughts and his ideas on that within this book. And then we can move on to newer books that, once again, twist these kind of things. Now, I would say all of this happens in this book and the next two books. They are, as I said, part of the fantastic tradition and being aware of these other elements can help or illuminate some of the things, or can give us just a perspective to look at how does Guy Gavril K engage with the mountain of story and appreciate his craft, because there is a lot of craft in this book. The prose is fantastic, the way he cites by not citing um, certain sources, that kind of stuff, it's brilliant. One final point, he does add sexuality in a way that is not within while talking, and I think it's an important element that we'll come back to next week. I just wanted to make sure that I have mentioned it already. It is in here, and we will probably come back and talk about, well, the sexual assault that is in here as well. Um, I think it is handled well, but I want to wait until we talk about the next book at least so we can um, engage with it fuller on maybe also the mythological stage. So thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you learned a lot. Um, I hope you enjoyed um, The Summer Tree. I think it's a fantastic story in a lot of ways. It moves me for some reason. I really vibe with, the, with uh, some of the characters. It's great in that regard. It does have its flaws. Don't get me wrong, but I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope my pointers do help you engage with um, fantasy in general in a better way. If that's the case, I don't know, give it a like. I don't know, share it with some friends who want to know more about fantasy. Um, um, tell me what you think in the comments. Um, maybe, maybe even subscribe to my Patreon if you feel like I deserve some money, because why not? But if you think teachers should be under, you know, underpaid like they are, that's also fine. Don't worry. I'm glad you stayed this long, and I'm glad to talk to you tomorrow about something else and next week when we talk about the wandering fire and mythology. And until then, have a great Sunday, kids, and I'll see you soon. Cheers.